So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Pratik. I'm one of the advisory board of Bridge India, and I am delighted to have you all here at today's very interesting session. It's called Realizing the Vision of an Atman Atmanirbhar Bharat. On 12th of May this year, Prime Minister Narendra Modi made mention of a new industrial strategy for the nation. Uh, this was based on self-reliance for the country, and it was an evolution on the Make in India slogan of his first term. But this time it had more of an emphasis on disentangling from global supply chains that are reliant on China. Uh, in fact, just in the last 24 hours, we saw that uh, 15 licenses of uh, Chinese companies that had been given uh, antibody test kit licenses in India were cancelled uh, because of uh, the Atma Atmanirbhar Bharat initiative. Uh, some of the headline announcements that the government made a few weeks ago included the changing of the definition of MSMEs, boosting scope for private participation in numerous sectors, increasing FDI in the defense sector, greater private engagement in downstream space activities, and much, much more. The hope is that we have uh, a COVID crisis, a big pandemic right now that the whole world is struggling with, but this will be a good opportunity to launch a new set of economic priorities and a new industrial strategy, which, which will uh, stand India in good stead for the coming decade. So how has Make in India evolved into this new strategy? How feasible is this mission, given that we're in an economic downturn? Will this affect FDI positively, or will it not have much impact? What are the key sectors to focus on, and how is this seen from outside India by potential investors? What further steps does the government need to take in order to help Prime Minister Modi realize this vision? And if, is it correct to see this vision as a bold and swift shift to self-reliance for India's economy? Or is this just a return to protectionism, uh, just marketed in a different way? So these are some of the things we're going to be talking about today. I'm delighted to have on my panel, uh, Ambassador Amrinder Katua, who's a, a very distinguished Indian diplomat, We've got Sumit Sharma, Regional Director of the Indo-German Chamber of Commerce, who's based in Bangalore. Bart D'Souza, who's the Head of Aerospace at the Department for International Trade uh, uh, from the British government. Uh, he's in Delhi right now. And then we've got James Quinn, who's the CEO of a very exciting British company called Haradian that's based in Sheffield, in the heartland of uh, where the Industrial Revolution started in Britain uh, several hundreds of years ago. Um, let me just come to uh, Ambassador first. Uh, I'll ask each of the panelists to give comments for five or six minutes. Uh, for all the attendees, you can post questions throughout and you'll also see audience polls coming up. When you see the poll coming up, please uh, click on the relevant option uh, and please use the, the, the chat function as well. Uh, so Ambassador, over to you for some initial comments. Ambassador, can you can you hear us? I think you're uh, you're on mute. Okay. Wonderful. Please go ahead. This one. Yeah. Yes. Uh, good morning to all of you. Before we start about. 12th May Declaration of Atman Nirvara Prime Minister. Two things one must point out. One, COVID has affected global economic scenario. When I say it has affected global economic scenario, it has affected the liquidity availability, fall in exports by all the countries, then fear of sudden increase in imports in the post COVID period strain on foreign exchange revenue, as well as foreign exchange reserve, changed domestic uh, priorities of developed countries, and problem faced by MSMEs. Then second is, when you are talking about India, you must realize the impact of COVID is very serious. Today, Indian economy, which is almost 2.3 trillion, only 25% is functional. Uh, un unemployment uh, at the moment is almost 11% reason increase. 
contraction of economy is almost 30% in this quarter. In these circumstances, when we are talking about Prime Minister Modi's declaration of Atmanirva of 12 May, there we talk about one, yes, India over medium term and long term must make a plan and prepare for uh, self-reliance initiative in a serious manner. Second, you must understand uh, China is our number one trading partner. Trade and services together, it is almost $185 billion. There are 35,000 Indian industries which are functioning in China. There are 3,700 Chinese companies which are operational in India, in each sector. So for example, uh, till 1985, India used to be one of the biggest bulk drug exporter of the world. Today, India imports 64% of its APIs from China to produce bulk drug. In these circumstances, when we are talking about Atmanirbha, we are talking about one, India must prepare itself in the post-COVID phase. Second, India must identify those technologies uh, those production facilities, those collaborations, which have come under Make in India to expand and grow bigger. So, for example, if we are talking about Make in India, uh, so for example, in uh, uh, auto sector, $74 billion worth of production has come in uh, under Make in India. Our target in 2026 is $300 billion. In the uh, 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 new initiative, Atmanirbhar initiative. Can we expand this to include the growth about 12% of the GDP, 65 million jobs, 35% of export of the total products? Uh, cutting across the sector, similar things are in electronic system design and manufacturing sector, renewable energy sector, roads and highways sector, pharma sector, food process processing sector, etc. It's excellent news that uh, in the defense, automatic route has been increased from 49% to 74%. Uh, but I, I let me be brief because we will discuss it further. The whole issue of Atmanirbhar depends on one, good economic diplomacy, two, good medium term planning following post COVID phase, and third is identification of the technology. So for example, a large number of uh, companies are interested to come to India. But what is India's requirement? And what uh, we can produce in India, which can be supplied to South Asian, African, and Southeast Asian countries? Say, let me give you one example. Say, we talk about um, uh, renewable energy sector. Uh, polysilicon is one of the uh, prime thing which every country needs. Other than China, only four companies produce polysilicon. The technology, product and collaboration factor. They are in Korea, Norway, uh, United States, and Germany. Can we convince and bring them to India, telling, telling them that Indian market itself will be almost $150 billion in the next 20 years? And from Indian base, if we produce the export revenue itself, the, uh, uh, what we export the revenue itself will come to about $60, $70 billion. And India is participating in the India International Solar Alliance. All these factors must be combined before we think about uh, Atmanirbhar uh, going further and becoming a success. And also, let me tell you, in the globalized world, notwithstanding presence of WTO, notwithstanding presence of uh, nationalism, etc., very few countries are totally Atmanirbhar. Within Atmanirbhar, we have to also define sectors activities and how we are going to achieve it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I, it takes me back to my year one of uh, learning economics at university when we used to learn about small open economies and large closed economies. It was very interesting to model it in an economic framework, but in real life, I, economists always say real life is a special case. Uh, so that's when the economic models don't apply any longer. Uh, can I please come over to, to Bart uh, from the DIT? Uh, can you give me a little bit of, of your perspective on this? Yeah. 
Thanks, Pradeek. Uh, I agree with the ambassador that yes, uh, segmentation, sub-segmentations, and to understand the needs of India is primary to take uh, Atmanirbhar ahead. Well, uh, to all uh, those attending, I represent the 35 billion aerospace industry in the United Kingdom with over 80% in global experts. Globally acclaimed that the UK aerospace industry have advanced capabilities in all segments of space and aerospace and unique for its prowess in manufacturing, MROs, research and development, leaders in artificial intelligence, automation, innovation. I would begin by saying that uh, Atmanirbhar Abhiyan is not, I repeat, not a reset point. This initiative by the government is a progressive next phase to the Make in India initiative launched in 2014. India have uh, major manufacturing capabilities and paradoxically also are highly dependent on imports to fulfill domestic consumption. Evidently, there is a gap. To my mind, Atmanirbhar Abhiyan is a campaign to bridge the gap that will help India sustain long-term requirements and become self-sufficient. On the feasibility of the Atmanirbhar Abhiyan, let us look at it empirically. And uh, since I represent the aerospace and defense segment, I would more specifically like to use the example of the shipbuilding in industry to initiate this discussion. Late last year in August, uh, the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, the F or FICI, wrote a strongly worded note to the Defense Minister, Rajnath Singh, asking the Ministry of Defense to end the practice of nominating defense public sector undertaking shipyards to build warships for the Navy and the Coast Guards. More recently, four Indian companies, Bharat Forge, Tata Aerospace and Defense, Mahindra Defense Systems and Adani Defense, contending for the Make in India program to manufacture 111 naval utility helicopters under the strategic partnership model in collaboration with a foreign technology provider. The private sector wants the center or the federal government to bar Hindustan Aeronautics Limited or HAL from the 2.5 billion plan to manufacture naval utility helicopters, saying that the state-owned company has a unique advantage as it has access to government-funded infrastructure and the ability to cross-subside the bid through other nominated orders. Well, the Ministry of Defense uh, uh, countered it and said that the company uh, that uh, so the warship orders are competitively tendered. They say that the PSU or the public sector yards were nominated to build only 56 ships, while the private sector was allowed to participate in tendering for 90 ships, 62% of the total numbers. While that is so, 38% of the orders that were nominated to the public sector yards included all high value ships, adding up to 95% of the monetary value. Only 62% where the private sector could compete involves small, low-value auxiliary vessels. The in industry body, FIKI, further contended that the PSU had pocketed 95% of the orders through nomination. They possess ample resources to cross subsidize, subsidize their bids in the remaining orders, and they were completely outnumbered. Consequently, the private shipyards had to resort to gross underbidding just to remain in the business. If we introspect our journey, in November 2010, the Defense Minister A.K. Antony had pledged from January 2011 onwards, the Defense Acquisition Council will not give any nominations to the, to the defense shipyards for naval projects, and they will have to compete with the private shipyards for tenders. Very little has changed in practice. Between 2011 and 19, we have the PSUs or the defense uh, uh, government shipyards were nominated for 85% by value of shipbuilding contract, con constituting almost $20 billion. The private sector, in contrast, participated in just 15% of the tenders worth just $3.5 billion. So with huge contracts already in hand, the industry body says the PSUs began resorting to rampant cross-subsidization to win 10.4% of the programs, leaving a mere 4.6% for the private sector. So for my remarks, I would say, for making India Atmanirbhar in defense production, the, gov the government along with armed forces, private industries, and the defense PSU will have to walk the talk. India needs to make a dedicated effort to ramp up defense manufacturing. It is a shame that the country has to depend on foreign players, even for the supply of most basic weapons, such as the rifle. The private companies uh, will have to acknowledge that they cannot get everything on a platter. 
they should not limit Make in India to just assembling or manufacturing through its tie-ups with foreign players. The private sector will have to invest money in research and stay put for a long haul. As for the government, it must handhold these companies and give them the required support. The Department for International Trade, whom I represent, or the, or the UK industry, aerospace industry, is a major catalyst in the Atmanirbhar program. And there are three key enablers that I see in this Atmanirbhar program for the UK aerospace industry. The first is identifying complementarity of capabilities in the manufacturing and MROs. UK have an advanced technology that complement the Indian manufacturing and MRO industry to cater to the domestic markets. We have optimization of resources and capacity is the new mantra. UK provides a solution. I give an open invitation to the Indian aviation industry that they that that are focused on domestic programs. The Department of International for International Trade at the British High Commission will find them a match to plug the technology gap. And lastly, we need to foster trade in terms of an air freight corridor between India and UK. Look at lower inventory holding costs and to make available spares, consumables, on-time delivery. More importantly, connect Europe industry to India to service the domestic industry here. Thanks. Thank you so much, Bart. Uh, and I should also say for, for our uh, viewers in terms of context, in the last uh, 20 years, the UK has invested more than $30 billion into India. And it's been increasing its investment into the country year on year over the last four years. Uh, right now, about eight or 9% of all the FDI that comes into India is from British companies. And of that, about 75 to 80 percent is uh, invested in three states, uh, three or four states. I think uh, Delhi NCR, Maharashtra, which is essentially Mumbai and its surrounding areas, uh, as far as British investment goes, uh, Karnataka, uh, where uh, German companies like Bosch also have a massive presence, and also Gujarat. Uh, so in the east of India, only about 2 percent of Indian uh, uh, British investment has gone there over the last 20 years. Um, but it's been these, these three or four hubs of Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore, where that investment has concentrated. Uh, can I now come over to uh, Sumit from the Indo-German Chamber of Commerce to, to share his thoughts? Uh, thanks, Pratik, uh, for having me at your forum. Thanks to your team. Um, my greetings to uh, the various team participants and uh, also the viewers who have joined us. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, it's still early in... Uh, in Germany, England, uh, on a Saturday afternoon. So you are really passionate about India. And I saw that in the result of the poll also, that many of you are uh, very positive about the endeavor. Um, special greetings to uh, Mrs. Yetta, uh, who is the Consul General of Denmark in Bangalore. I see that she is also here. So greetings to you, Yetta. Um, I would uh, basically, Pratik, uh, break down my talk in four points. Uh, how I see the whole Atmanirbhar uh, view. Uh, I think uh, if, you, if you look at the speeches which have happened till now from the Prime Minister and some of his ministers, um, they have been very careful in not sounding at all protectionist. You know, I, uh, while we have, uh, in fact, uh, banned some Chinese apps, as you rightly mentioned, tenders from the government, uh, government tenders, but I feel the intent is quite clear, that at least that's how I see it. As some of the speakers mentioned, to basically increase India's um, share of the world supply chain, uh, basically revive our own uh, economy, revive the Make in India program, revive our industry, and uh, reduce dependence on certain countries. Uh, so that is how I see till now uh, the, the vision of Atmanirbhar. Of course, we are seeing news every day, Almost every day we are hearing something or the other, but I really hope that we don't go into a protectionist mode. I do not think so we will go into that. Uh, my second point is a little bit on uh, China. Dr. Bhattu also mentioned, of course, with your experience. Let's not forget, uh, people, we, we received 20 coffins. We received 20 dead bodies. So I think uh, what I see is that India is very clear that for us, it cannot be business as usual with China. Um, uh, because unlike, uh, unlike the EU, unlike USA, unlike, uh, unlike uh, Canada or Germany, uh, which can continue to rely on China, which they have benefited a lot from the growth of China. Unfortunately, I think for India, we are not in the same position. The 
while we are very dependent on certain sectors, so 80%, some sectors we are dependent, 40%. But I think with our geopolitical situation, it cannot be business as usual. So I think um, that is why I think the Prime Minister has also mentioned in his speech that in certain strategic areas, we will certainly be careful. Uh, because certainly you can't be sharing all your, uh, all your data, all your industry to someone with whom you don't have a friendly relation with. So I think on that point, I see that the Indian side is very, very, uh, very, very uh, clear about that. And you can see from the border also that the disengagement is taking very long. Uh, finally, today there is some good news. Uh, we can only hope that both sides disengage and then, then we can look at uh, how we can do our work. Uh, my third point is uh, perhaps some of our viewers are from uh, Europe. And they are not really aware of what is happening in India. So maybe Pratik, I'll take a couple of minutes to further reiterate that let's not forget that India is going through a huge transition. India is basically under construction. India is in a reform process, and this is not. Uh, this is not. This is a marathon. This is a steeple chase, you know, which which has various hurdles because of the fact that we are a democracy, because of our historical uh, issues. And if you look at what the government has done, is that the reform measures uh, have come in very quick succession of each other. Uh, the GST, the demonetization, then we are hit with Corona. So I think of, of what has happened is that all this uh, trying to do a kind of a manthan in India, it has, uh, it has led to uh, the MSME being in a very, very weak spot. At least that is what I feel from my interaction that that the companies are really, uh, uh, really looking for help. And unlike China, we, we, we are not state sponsored. You know? So the, uh, the, the government tries to help them out. It gives them loan, it tries to help, but it is not the handholding, uh, which we mentioned in the beginning, uh, we certainly need, but it is not the same handholding. So the companies are not in a good shape. Uh, the rescue package, which has come, the three lakh crores, uh, I think it is basically, I look at it as like a ventilator support till the end of the year. So I think the government will really have to do something more once we get out of the corona uh, infection to further pump liquidity into the market so that the demand is reviving. Uh, I maybe zoom out a little bit on our competitiveness. Uh, uh, friends, eventually the business will come to a country which is competitive. You know, if we can produce a product at a lower price, compared to, let's say, uh, Indonesia or Vietnam, I think automatically the, the, the business will start coming to India. So eventually, competitiveness will speak for itself. And here, I would say uh, India is not a low-cost country. Uh, certainly not. We, we, we may have lower, uh, cheaper workforce, but in the other areas, there is still a long way to go, you know, with the... Uh, with our power bills, with our logistics costs, with our land issues, um, infrastructure continues to be a challenge. Uh, our ITIs, uh, which are kind of the backbone, Pratik, um, of uh, let's say the reason why Germany became successful is primarily because of the Mittelstand and why the, the, how the vocational training could really energize the companies. Whereas in India, the ITIs are basically defunct, you know, so they need a complete revival. Um, also, then our dependence on China on, the, on certain sectors is extremely, extremely risky. So I think to cut me short if I'm exceeding my time, uh, I will take another two minutes. Basically, in mobile electronics, I think uh, we are in a really, really uh, tough situation. Uh, I don't think India can really be Atmanirbhar in certain areas very quickly, at least not so soon. Uh, it, will, it will be a long, long way, at least in certain areas. Um, and maybe my last point, Pratik, what are the chances, you know, where, where do I see the chance, basically? I think our India's biggest chance is, again, in our uh, youth, uh, in, in the fact that we are a young country. And we are a young country in the middle of an aging world. So that is our real big chance. So the companies which are coming here, we have close to 1,500 German ventures in India. They are basically here because there is a high local demand here. Um, and um, and I think I think amidst the fact that India is not really that easy a place to do business in, I think that is one. Let's say a uh, positive thing is that the German companies, which are traditionally family-owned, 
uh, not really risk uh, ready to take risk they have actually done fairly well in india despite the challenges of uh, of uh, of uh, you know doing business here um, maybe i'll come again later maybe one more point i would say is that uh, we have certainly proved our metal in certain areas you know it uh, be it the startup sector be it information technology even in automobile space research uh, i think i think we have proved that we can do it however the way i see it i think uh, the, the government will really have to handhold uh, the industry uh, to 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 sort of you know join the dots which unfortunately you know we are a very creative nation we are a young nation but unfortunately we are not really good at kind of getting the ecosystem together and joining the dots and that i hope uh, india can do while the business is slow because when the business is good then you don't have time to innovate then you don't have time to think out of the box whereas now uh, i think the government can do the necessary reforms to fix the institutions which will help our msm so the, uh, for me maybe my starting view and then i can come in again later okay thank you so much amit and as you rightly mentioned um uh, german and indian ties have gone on for a long time in in fact india was one of the first nations to establish diplomatic ties with germany after the two world wars uh, and the indian prime minister actually visited germany as early as 1956 for the first time in the 1960 and then that german india collaboration has continued since then so i'm i'm very happy to have uh, both germany and britain one of the two of the biggest uh, seven or eight investors in in india present on this call represented on this call um next i want to come to uh, a a great uh, example of a of a german british indian collaboration which is uh, james who who lives in munich works in sheffields and is expanding in india <laughs> over to you james uh, and i'm an american <laughs> and you're an american <laughs> excuse me uh thank thank you fatigue and uh, thanks to all the panelists for letting me be here as well so my name is james quinn i'm the ceo of ferradian and we're the world leading uh what we call beyond lithium which is sodium ion battery technology and so maybe just a, a little bit of my perspective coming a little bit from the outside here um it, just just a brief background when i talk about energies and beyond lithium lithium ion technology was invented in oxford university uh the nobel prize was given in december for chemistry for the lithium cobalt oxide to professor john goodenoff that was invented in oxford university our co-founder and chairman of the board chris wright was responsible for licensing that technology uh into the market and to a, a a number of companies and probably the most famous one is sony and sony first commercialized that technology in 1991 first patents were done in 1978 technology introduced into the market in the camp quarter in 1991 so a lot of lessons learned from that and what happened basically was by the time the products came into the market the patent barriers fell competition came into the market prices came down china entered the market and really put in an end to end strategy and today china controls the lithium ion uh technology worldwide the supply chain manufacturing and so forth so if i talk about india in particular i think india is a very interesting scenario very similar country in terms of size uh 1.33 versus 1.36 billion so very very similar in that respect um however india is heavily reliant as we all know on the middle east for its oil uh there's been initiatives to reduce that it's actually increased over the last few years i believe it's gone up about 42% in 2018 um and so it's heavily dependent on oil from from the middle east and if you move towards lithium ion technology you you will become uh, basically dependent on china <clears throat> i think if you look at what are the growth drivers today for energy storage is a global shift in energy production so forcing focus towards renewables away from fossil fuels fuels but however renewable energy is not always on demand and and reduction of pollution government regulations incentives even social pressure for more environmentally friendly solutions and i think we see that more today since the covid situation as i understand there's people in in parts of northern india that are able to see the himalayas for the first time uh, blue skies in china you know the the airs have gone quiet from the airplanes and so forth so i think our expectation now what's possible is will is definitely will increase 
And this has created a shift towards a need for energy storage and lithium ion batteries are really controlled by China. If you take a look at India in terms of what is the future for India, I think if you look at the 30 most polluted cities in the world, 22 are in India. So it's a serious issue for, for India. It has to find solutions towards energy storage solutions. Today, the market, and I think in India in particular, is primarily a lead acid market. Uh, lithium ion is coming up. Um, and and I, I think if you take a look at uh, Made in India initiative, it's not the same thing in my view as, as self-reliance. I think there can be two different things. And if you take a look at, uh, maybe if I just kind of break down the lithium ion supply chain for a moment and give you an idea of what I think are the key barriers to growth. And the main concern is energy security. You cannot outsource your energy security. If you want to be self-reliant, you need to have control of your own energy security. And I think that goes for, you know, that's not just India, that's any country in the world. And I think if you, if you take a look, there's been strategic plays in energy by Japan, South Korea, China, and this is found across the supply chain. China in particular really created, um, you know, the scales in their favor with respect to manufacturing investment. China has approached the problem really with an end-to-end -end strategy. They basically uh, built the factories for lithium ion technology, competed with really low cost. They created incentives to drive demand to fill the factories. And then they took control of the material supply chain. And I think that's really an important issue that, that I think if you take a look at the made in India perspective, even if you want to manufacture lithium ion batteries in, in India, the materials controlled by China. So the, in a cell of a battery, 80% of the cost is the materials. It's not the, the manufacturing, it's not the, the labor and so forth. 80% of that cost in the cell is the materials. So you can get a made in India stamp by putting, uh, making battery packs in India, but you're not necessarily having self-reliance because you're still uh, involved in supply chain from China. China controls 65% of the, the world supply of graphite, which is used for the anode in lithium ion batteries. Uh, in terms of lithium ion, they have 30 times the reserves than the US has in the world. Cathode, which is one of the key components in lithium ion, is controlled by uh, cobalt, which is 72% is of the refinement of cobalt is controlled by China. They've invested in the mines heavily. And, and it's a really horrible material in terms of sustainability. Um, in terms of 25% of cobalt is informally mined, which is a nice word for child labor. It's a really, it's, it's, a, it's a material that has to be engineered out of, of batteries for the future. Um, so I think what, what what, if you take a look at sodium ion technology, it's the next generation beyond lithium. And I think India has a unique opportunity to get out in front of the next technology for energy storage, create energy security and a more sustainable technology. In, in my view, sustainability is not just a PR, it's a nice statement to put up, it has to be serious. If you look at sodium, it's the sixth most abundant element on earth. Um, it's essentially unlimited. And we have no lithium, we have no cobalt, we have no copper, we have no graphite in our technology. So what that means is it can be manufactured in India and it can be sourced in India. And it's, it's, so it's not only uh, gives you energy security, which means environmental security, economic security, and national security, it's also more sustainable uh, material. It's not mined, it's a, it's a much more um, environmentally friendly type of a solution here. So I, I think India cannot outsource its energy security. I think you have to become self-reliant and take control of your own energy. I think you have an opportunity from a market perspective to get out in front beyond lithium of next generation technology and be able to address your environmental issues in country, source materials with indigenous and, and don't make sustainability a pure PR statement. Make it something that is really meaningful and, and demonstrate it. I think in order for that to happen, you really need a more of an end-to-end -end strategy here. Um, there was, uh, let's see if I can find the, the point, um, Prime Minister Modi last year had tweeted about an end-to-end -end strategy for India. He said, India future energy really has four pillars, energy access, energy efficiency, energy sustainability, and energy security. So what does that mean? Access means electrification rules, right? For after 2030. So really access means incentives to drive demand, not just for the consumer, but also for the manufacturers of it. Efficiency needs to lower the cost, 
needs to reduce demand on energy imports and reducing greenhouse effects. Sustainability means not only meeting present energy needs with more sustainable materials, but also being able to enhance your energy security with lower risk on imported oil energy. And security addresses, as I said, national security, availability of natural resources for energy consumption, and basically access to cheap energy. Lithium ion, uh, compared to sodium ion technology, sodium ion at the same energy density as lithium ion has the opportunity to be 25, 30% less expensive than lithium because it's using really inexpensive raw materials. It's not using the cobalt, it's not using those things. So this is a very energy security focused viewpoint, of course, because uh, that's, that's the business that I'm in. Uh, and I think it's a, it, it's a unique opportunity. And I think we've seen how China has dominated the supply chain worldwide. This is not just an India problem. This is a problem worldwide in the US. It's a problem in the UK. There's big issues right now with China and the UK as well. I mean, we're talking air conditioning, wedding dresses, you're talking antibiotics. And, and I saw this with my company I had in Silicon Valley back in the September 11th from 2001, where all of a sudden we couldn't ship our products. And it became very clear that there were a lot of dependencies on certain countries or, or, or regions or locations. And I think we see this right now with, with China. Self-reliance means being able to not just have made in India, but to really truly be able to rely on your own internal resources, natural resources, um, and really being able to get out in front of next generation technology. I think it's a huge opportunity for India. And so that's, that's kind of my perspective. Yeah. Thank you so much, James. So I think if, if I summarize some of the salient points from what everyone has said, I think one point that's come up again and again from Ambassador's comments right the way through to James mm -hmm. is uh, India should try and go up the value chain. So higher focus and investment on R&D. Uh, another point that I've heard a, a few times is a much greater coordinated private sector participation not just handing scraps to the private sector, as, as we heard from Bart in the aerospace sector, but uh, using the, the, the skills and the know-how and the international experience of the private sector to really drive uh, champions. In some sectors, India has done phenomenally well. So Reliance Geo is a global phenomenon that probably no one who read the Financial Times two years ago knew what Geo was. Uh, probably a lot of Financial Times readers in London didn't know what Geo was two months ago. Now everybody knows. So I think in some sectors, India has done phenomenally well there. And another point is an end-to-end -end strategy. And I think that that came across in, in all the comments as well. So we start from the raw materials right the way to the last mile access for customers. If India can crack that, uh, then that means a true self-reliant uh, supply chain, self-reliant value chain, uh, which then in turn, from a macro perspective, means jobs, it means prosperity, it means much more sustainable economic growth. Um, I, I want to come to Ambassador just, just for his comments here and his reactions. Um, but the, the, the last thing I just wanted to add is actually two things. One, if, if any of you who are watching want to ask questions or add in comments, please do so now. Now is the time that we'll get into the Q&A. Um, but James mentioned one really important point that out of the 30 most polluted cities in the world, 22 of them are in India. So certainly uh, reading uh, the, the financial papers in India, when we talk about infrastructure and building India, the conversation is always about real estate, about construction and things you can see. But there is softer infrastructure there, which is urban planning, uh, public health, uh, education, uh, just having gardens and parks in cities which mitigate against the, uh, this big problem of, of pollution. Um, uh, that's something India hasn't focused on a lot. If, uh, if the world's most polluted cities used to be in China 15 years back, China has, has addressed that problem phenomenally well, uh, whereas India has been a big laggard. Um, and incidentally, out of the other top 10 uh, most polluted cities in the world, there's one from Pakistan, I think, the rest are from India and maybe one from Mexico City and maybe one from China at the very most. Um, so I'll just, just stop there. there. There's a lot of uh, things to unpack. Uh, Ambassador, do, do you want to uh, uh, come in with your comments? Ambassador Katua, can you, can you hear us? Uh, I will add a couple of 
Uh, I have just a couple of points. The point is, you must understand India is a unity in the diversity. You have 500 million poor, 400 million middle class, 300 million public sector rich and government employees. Therefore, this market situation was most similar to Kyoto Atmanirbhar because this also determines the economic run, the MSMEs, and the need of getting foreign investment. The second part is, as I told you, uh, just fulfilling the best needs of these people means the, uh, you, talk, you spoke about infrastructure. So we are talking about 61,300 kilometers of highway to be constructed in next year. Uh, similarly, we are talking about when you are talking about roads, digging the tunnels, building rail bridges, uh, uh, in, uh, inland waterways. This is its another project of almost 200 million next year. All these these things must be seen in a overall perspective. When I say uh, we are so much dependent on China, I'm not saying that I'm not without China. But India must think about champ loss. Our country, India, is dependent on the country loss. Therefore, looking for the market, looking for the technology, uh, uh, India is a very limited role now. But you cannot do it with them. Private sector, public sector measures can be used to provide lots of lands for quite a bit of holding they can do. Uh, are the government databases and do if you like and work with them? Some of these points must be taken into account when we are talking about conservation. Then uh, last point is skills. Say this is very important thing. Uh, skilling of skilling and uh, training. These things within the Indian population, say like lots of people are coming back because of COVID from Middle East and different places. Uh, it is said that areas of things they have, which industry developers working in governments, use them in the during the Atma Level strategy. Thank you. Uh, th thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we've had a few questions right. come through now. Uh, uh, so thank you to Dr. Raj Mistry from Nottingham uh, uh, for, for his comment. Uh, India has the opportunity to lead the world in focusing on green development, reducing pollution, um, and uh, focusing on solar power. Uh, we've got a, another question from uh, Kayuzi Villamoria, who says, uh, for Atman Bharat to succeed, Indian industry needs to become far more cost effective than its international competitors. The productivity of the workforce needs to improve significantly, and there needs to be far more support from the Indian government to eliminate bottlenecks and provide tariff concessions. Uh, Bart, I, I come over to you for your comments on, on some of these uh, observations. You're on mute, I think. Apologies, apologies. Sorry. Uh, so I I would agree with these uh, co co comments, and uh, really, what I would want to bring out is that we need to look at the way that we have come through. You know, like uh, I would again stick to the aerospace and defense uh, industrialization process, and uh, you know, basically India went through a three phase process from independence to around the mid sixties, and then sixties to the eighties, and eighties to the present. So in the first uh, phase, uh, self-sufficiency or Atmanirbhar was an overall economic principle behind its industrial development. We had some success. The model had considerable weaknesses also because of the low level of defense allocations and defense R&D uh, budget. In addition to the lack of civil industrial base, which was a major impact during this first phase. In the second phase, according uh, particularly the 1962 border war with China and the 1964-65 uh, Indo-Pak war brought a major change in the Indian's uh, defense policy and terms of self-reliance was replaced with self-sufficiency in the defense production. 
So there we saw not only was the Indian budget percentages of a GDP increased in the subsequent years, but also the approach towards arms procurement policy and indigenous defense production took off. Moreover, unlike in the first stage of industrialization and the second stage of India's defense industrialization, more attention was paid to licensed production rather than indigenous production based on its own design and development efforts. However, this led to dependency on the licensed-based defense production. India's uh, aeronautic industry is such a case whose dependency continues till date. In the third phase, uh, that is after the 80s, when increasingly aware of the pitfalls of over de dependence, India began to change its approach, you know, from defense industrialization, from license based production to production based on indigenous designs. Thus, there was emphasis on self-reliance or self-sufficiency, co-production with higher importance on promoting the participation of the Indian private sector in the defense production. Uh, in fact, uh, our, uh, the defense advisor or the scientific advisor to the defense minister and subsequently the president of India, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, came up with a, a theory on reflecting the percentage share of indigenous content in the total procurement expenditures in, in its bid to make India self-reliant. This meant that the share of indigenous, indigenous contribution to the total procurement in, uh, expenditure would progressively increase from uh, in the estimated in 90 to 93 at 30% to about 70% uh, to about 2005-2008. Although India developed vast defense industrial bases over the years, the objective of achieving 70% self-reliance has not been achieved so far. We need to understand that these are hard facts. India's heavy dependence on arms import for defense preparedness defies the very objective of self-reliance and that it has set for itself. You know, the self-reliance index has barely improved from the 90s of 30%, which is about uh, 35 uh, or 38% uh, uh, around 2013, 2014, and indicates our failure, basically, in the defense industrialization process and demands serious introspection. And uh, I agree with the comments uh, that were put in the chat box. And uh, uh, I would add to it and say that at present, we need to understand that defense, India's total R&D account budget accounts for about 6% of the defense budget, which itself is uh, less than 2% of the GDP. In fact, if you go by our budget uh, for the last year, we haven't even uh, uh, catered to the committed liabilities. So if we haven't uh, uh, catered to that, and if you take out the pensions and salaries and all, there's no money or there's no budget for newer expenditures or for capital expenditures. So we need to look at, the, then it's significant to look at the, uh, and assess where India stands now in the global scenario on a self-reliance in defense production. So although today India has reached about 100% uh, in terms of self-reliance, in terms of deterrence, it needs to minimize the dependency on foreign countries for its defense needs by enhancing indigenization of its defense production sectors. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for that. Uh, we've got another question come through from uh, the uh, Consul General of uh, Denmark in, in Bangalore. Uh, she's got a background in, in oncology and life sciences and nuclear medicine. So, um, uh, Sumit, I just, uh, Sumit, uh, you, you, you know her well, so I just want to take this next question for you. Um, she's asking, uh, what is your viewpoint in terms of the need to potentially align the current tender processes in India with government uh, to increase access and motivation to engage with India and the ease of doing business for foreign SMEs? I guess from a German perspective, uh, uh, for, for big uh, PLCs, it's relatively easier to do business in India, but for Mittelstand kind of companies, which are two or three generations old in SMEs, India is still a difficult market to, to access. It has different challenges from maybe Malaysia or, or China or, or uh, other competitors in Southeast Asia, but it's still a difficult market. What are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I completely agree uh, to what you said, Pratik, uh, and the comment from Yete is also very valid. Um, I, think, I think from the German success, uh, there are a few things which we certainly can learn and share with the other countries also from the developed world. Um, you know, one is that I think the, the reason that they could really uh, survive in India, that they could continue to kind of wait for profits to come, which do not come immediately, they do take their time. I think the Germany had the advantage that these were basically family-owned companies. 
so um, so that is why uh, with a lot of uh, heritage and history so while the decision making to come to india was certainly slow uh, sometimes running into a decade but eventually when they took the decision they they uh, they basically decided to stay here and not go back so i think uh, that was kind of the little advantage that uh, germany had uh, that that the companies were not so um, not so uh, profit oriented that every second year uh, the balance sheet should show you know multiple profits so they are here for the long term and that is why because of the nature that they are family owned they could kind of do well here um, i think one thing on a generic uh, way jeta uh, i'll try to reply to your question um, uh, i think uh, india may in the coming uh, months try to further um, further uh, diversify uh, and engage with the foreign trade agreements also uh, with various countries which we still have not signed i mean i'm not saying that ftas are a guarantee to the business sometimes we have seen in the past that even after signing the ftas uh, the business did not take off or it actually rebounded but i think uh, i think india will now certainly have to look at this aspect uh, i think with the united states we are already hearing some uh, new talks on that and with the european union also we just recently concluded the eu india talks there was no big headlines there but i get the feeling that uh, india will in the coming years try to engage more uh, with the uk with the united states and also our other partners who can who can complement uh, what india may kind of uh, i'm i'm just assuming assuming a worst case scenario that if if with china the 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 trade will be extremely strict then uh, then it will further hit our um, uh, you know it will further hit our competitiveness because the products then we cannot manufacture immediately we will need to import them from somewhere i mean right now we are in a corona situation so right now the demand is not so much in india but six months later once the corona effect is over and the sudden demand comes then certainly india will need for Uh, newer countries and newer supply chains, you know, to fill its uh, to fill its uh, needs, which which cannot domestically be met immediately. I do not know if I answered your question yet, sir, but yeah. Wonderful. Um, so I uh, focused a lot lot on the, the the challenges to India becoming self reliant, but of course, uh, James is already elected to come into India and has announced a couple of big partnerships. Uh, one of the questions that's come up is from Amitav Nanda, who asks, uh, "I believe Faradian can open a different dimension for the Indian battery industry. What do you think will be the most critical challenge if Faradian plans to enter into mass production in India?" So, James, I'll, I'll hand over you to hand over to you for that, and then we've got about three or four minutes left after that, where I just want to get uh, any last questions that come up, and also some concluding remarks from the panelists. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, I, I, interestingly, one of the uh, we've also announced a uh, joint venture in Australia, and and so that's a great beachhead market for new technology because Australia is the most expensive electricity market in the world. So, as you're bringing a new technology to the market, you know it's good to have an advantage of having a very high cost market. Um, there's a lot of similarities between Australia and India in terms of high temperatures, environmental, remote areas, and access, and so forth. So, so there's a lot of good advantages for that. The difference is India is the least expensive electricity market in the world, so that makes it very difficult as you're entering uh, a market with a new technology. Uh, where your incumbent technology has had about a 35-year head start, right? So, so I think that's some of the challenges for us. And I think India, in particular, is very price sensitive, not necessarily cost of ownership focused. And I think that's a fundamental challenge. Um, when we look at the technology, we give better than lithium-ion performance at a lower cost than lead acid. But often price becomes one of the key challenges. So that's a challenge for us as a company. So we need to be able to have the, the right kind of partners. Not everything low cost is not necessarily make it the best solution. Um, I think if I think in aerospace, I think of the the story about the astronaut who's sitting in the in the cockpit getting ready to be launched into space, and he's in 
pressed at all the technology and then he realizes it was all done by the lowest bid, right? <laughs> so maybe you get a bit nervous about that. Um, I, think, I think, you know, what's important for us to have success is finding the right kind of partners that, that have flexibility because it's a new technology. So you need to be able to have flexibility in terms of your expectations, your specifications. You have to work together to, to you know, embrace the strategic nature and advantage of sodium ion technology and work to, to deploy it and to be able to scale it up. That's gonna be able to bring it down into low cost. Um, and I, I think that's the, that's the opportunity and it's the challenge for us right now. I think one of the big differences too that I see with all respect to India, there's a lot of announcements. You know, big news, big, big this, uh, you know, but no stone is turned in sometimes over two years. Uh, so whether it's local governments making announcements, whether it's big companies making announcements to build big gigawatt factories and then nothing happens. Uh, China is more quiet, but they're moving. They're working all the time. And we're currently producing our technology in China because we use the exact same lithium ion infrastructure. It's just different materials. So we produce on the same lines of producing LFP or NMC battery technology. We produce sodium ion, no special equipment, no nothing. You know, I would say if, if you want to go out to eat somewhere on Christmas Eve and you didn't make a reservation, there's always a Chinese restaurant open, right? They're always working. And I think we need to get India to get up, you know, to, to that same kind of drive, that same kind of, you know, approach. And, and, uh, and it has to be a coordinated effort. And it cannot, it does not happen by accident. It has to be really an end-to-end -end strategy. It has to be driven for that. And there has to be support. Look in the U.S., uh, you know, we had the great space race, you know, let's put a man on the moon. It got the whole nation motivated. I think there's an opportunity in India. People are ready for this big vision, this drive to be able to do something amazing and to take pride as a nation in doing that. And then what happened with the US is they just stopped. We put a man on the moon, mission accomplished, check. And then we started to have to pay Russia to send up astronauts into the International Space Station before SpaceX came around. And so I think you, there's a lot of lessons learned out there and that they can be applied to India and, and can get the whole nation behind the right type of strategy here. So that's just, again, uh, outsider's view here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we've got a, a question come through from Natasha Lewandowski in, in Berlin, um, who also worked uh, with the Indo-German Chamber of Commerce in, in Pune uh, until very recently. Um, how can India attract foreign investment, though it is not the easiest place to do business, uh, despite the, the current particular challenges? So uh, I think, uh, Sumit, that's directed to you, but I, I leave, um, you, you can include that, uh, the answer to that in your concluding comments. We've got yes. two or three yes. minutes left. Um, yes. Let's get 30 Maybe seconds. Uh, let's just yeah, get 30 seconds. Go, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I think uh, I think the biggest champions or the biggest uh, brand ambassadors for India going forward, as it tries to attract investment, are the companies who are actually here, the ones who are still here, the 1,500 of them. India should ensure that they are successful, that they do not face any challenges, as far as possible in terms of infrastructure or customs or skill development. And I sincerely believe that it is the best marketing strategy, you know, rather than going out, as someone said, making big statements, going outside, doing a lot of uh, expensive campaigns. The biggest thing, best thing India can do is to ensure that these companies, and these are the really the biggest companies, the Bosch, the Zenith, you know, the DH, the Lufthansa, if they are satisfied, if they are happy, then they will certainly put the word back uh, to their headquarters, and that is when the next wave of the smaller companies can have that confidence, because they will be listening to someone from their own land who has, uh, who has basically uh, made it in India. You know, finally. Yeah. Um, so, just concluding comments now. First, uh, to you, Ambassador, then Bart, and uh, uh, then James.
I think I think you're on mute, sir. Hello. Yes. Uh, I'll be absolutely brief. I believe the Atmanirbhar announcement by Prime Minister Prime Minister Modi is basically a strategy and a policy offering for one to attract investment, two to bring new technology, three to strengthen collaboration with strategic partners for joint ventures and third country collaboration. The process will take some time because of the, on the ongoing COVID situation. But I believe with the policy offerings, uh, trade reforms, steps taken to make business easy, there is ample opportunity for its success. And I believe in certain areas it will succeed because the need is home-based. India needs that. Thank you. Well, Pradeek, I'll come in without much ado, and uh, I would like to say in my closing comments that I, having uh, been part of the team which set up the aerospace park at Mihan in Nagpur, I fully endorse uh, the experience that James Finn has gone through, and uh, it's a fact. It's a fact that uh, when you have big FDIs and big companies coming in and say, I want to put in something, and then you have these, the government saying, yeah, please welcome the red carpet, you have all the bouquets, and when you finally go there, they tell you, okay, it'll, it'll cost you a couple of million dollars to set up a electro uh, Transformer, you need a water supply, you need sewage, you need to do this. And it adds to the project cost and sometimes at times makes it unviable. I have gone through that experience. Having said that, I would also want to uh, assure uh, the other panelists who, who spoke that we successfully, uh, you know, find complementarity between the existing capabilities in India and the technology uh, advanced aerospace companies in UK, where we successfully capitalize on the difference in technology to cater to the domestic Indian market. So that's a foreign entry strategy for SMEs, for bigger companies who want the, uh, the want uh, suppliers or the tier one, two, uh, or two, uh, two and three suppliers to move in closer to the operation. So as India's operation grows, you will find more and more companies will come in and they will find their own strategies to find a way in the Indian market. Thanks. Yeah, I just really echo all the comments from the other panelists here. I think, um, you know, in what, what I've seen works is really uh, where you have a seamless approach between universities, R&D, commercial, and government. And, you know, there's, there's funding there to be able to achieve objectives. You need to have a long-term strategy. This is not a short-term solution. Um, and, and, and I think the, the incentives and so forth need to be somewhat technology agnostic uh, because you don't know what's happening. What I find is a lot of what we see in Australia, for example, is there's a lot of laws around lithium ion technology because it, you know, it kind of got out of the gate before they got their, their hands around it. And uh, so it makes it difficult for new technologies to come in because the rules are or, or based on something else. It's often like airport security. It only happens after something, uh, uh, you know, was 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 happened. Uh, and and so I think you know, from from India has a, in my view, has a huge opportunity sitting in front of them. And I certainly hope it doesn't become a missed opportunity. And I think energy security, self reliance, all of these kinds of things is really within your grasp, really right now. Um, if there's a coordinated effort to be able to make this happen. Um, we have, I think I have more contacts on LinkedIn from India now than from anywhere else. Uh, there's, there's a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of startups, there's a lot of excitement around it, but it's still very slow in terms of converting everything into, uh, in, into, into you know, a commercial way and, and to bringing this to market. So um, let's hope we don't lose this uh, wonderful opportunity in front of us. Thank you. Sumit, do you have any last comments? Thanks, Pratik. I I would only say uh, while while I may have sounded very kind of negative and pessimistic, but I I truly believe in India, and I think we should not basically as Indians we should not be satisfied with what we have. I think um, I I remember when you know when we were growing up, uh, maybe a little philosophical comment. You know, that it was always that don't think too much, don't don't go beyond your reach. Uh, you know, don't take your feet out of the of the quilt. Uh, but I think India has to now really think big. 
India has to now really be more scientific uh, and you know basically go all out. And I think uh, the the one thing which we have, perhaps some of the other countries don't have, is the, our flexibility and our resilience. I I think I've, uh, I'm not I'm not saying it because I'm an Indian, but we are one of the most resilient and patient people. And I think um, and I think uh, as James said, as everyone said. Um, and and we can find quick solutions to problems, Pradeep, which is now the world we are getting into. Uh, it will need faster, more flexibility. And that is where I think Indians also have a good chance because we can basically be more adapt adaptive. So that would be my concluding comment, uh, Pradeep. Uh, so some, some, some key messages there, resilience uh, and patience is something that India has much more than other countries countries and that will certainly be tested in the coming weeks in the coming months uh, the economic downturn uh, as of today end of July 2020 India has suffered over the last few months is the deepest since uh, uh, India was formed as a country uh, and uh, India is absolutely nowhere near its peak of coronavirus cases so certainly the patience and the resilience will be tested um, just like the space race that James mentioned uh, from a US perspective, uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for India as a nation to come together around a common purpose and a common brand. A lot of what we've discussed today has been on the policy and the regulation side and, and practical steps, but also uh, the wrapper around all of that is the marketing and the PR and getting the whole country and India's people uh, uh, behind one joint vision, uh, whether that is uh, uh, Atman Nirbhar Bharat, whether that's Make in India, whether that's something else, I think this is the time for, for India to come together. There will certainly be challenges. Um, we have uh, eminent diplomats like Ambassador Amrinder Katwa who have been engaging in that track to diplomacy and engage very much in the coronavirus uh, response efforts from the government right now. Um, who are working on that both uh, from an Indian perspective as well as uh, projecting India in the right way abroad. Um, and we have uh, very reliable and long-term partners of India like Britain and Germany represented on this call. Um, I'd like to thank all of our attendees for, for being with us throughout this whole hour. I hope this was a useful session for you. I hope you learned something new. Um, uh, we as Bridge India would love to have you back at some of our future webinars. Next Saturday, we have one on uh, evolving Indo-US relationship, which will be looking at um, how India is getting closer or otherwise to the US government. One of the unique panelists we'll have there, which, which many of you uh, will not have heard from this particular perspective before, is an Indian Muslim origin candidate uh, from the Trump wing of the Republican Party standing for state Senate in Harlem in New York. You cannot get more diverse than that. Uh, and uh, we've got a number of other excellent panelists as well from think tanks and from academia, uh, from the Hudson Policy Institute in New York as well. That's next Saturday. Please have a look at our website. In the meantime, tweet at us, email us, send us through your comments. Um, and thank you to all the panelists for also joining us. Uh, this session will remain live on Facebook. Uh, so you can, if your colleagues haven't seen it, you can watch it on Facebook afterwards. We will also share a YouTube link with you uh, on Monday morning. Um, so again, if colleagues haven't managed to see it, please share the YouTube link. Uh, thank you all very much. Have an excellent rest of the day and see you soon. Thank you, Pratik. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you. Nice talking to you. Thank you as well. Goodbye, everybody.